All right. Hello, this is Stefan Kinsella. It's August 18th, 2023. And uh, my friend Jeff Barr is here, who's a lawyer in Las Vegas. We did an episode about a few weeks ago. This is uh, this is going to be Kate Kinsella on Liberty 418. I think we did 415 or 414. In the meantime, I did three other episodes on uh, Larkin Rose's uh, new movie. I don't know if you heard about this or saw it, Jeff, but... Um, Anyway, um, his movie Jones Plantation. Um, so you and I left off. We kind of we kind of meandered through. We did six. Found out what we agreed on. You um, you conceded a few points, which was uh, intellectually honest of you. I, well, I, I think you conceded a couple points too, but which is no, also I, I never conceded anything. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, I don't want to bury the lead, right? and, and and so I, I'd like to just kind of summarize my position. If that's all right. Uh, yeah, but let me set the stage. So what we're going to talk about is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to finish up on where we left off, which was we left off at this point about, uh, agreements or title transfers related to future things. I think that's the crux of our sort of disagreement because it plays into loan contracts and debtor's prison and theft and implicit theft and, breach of contract and all these kinds of issues. So, um, all right, go ahead, Jeff. All right. So as you mentioned, we did have this long previous discussion on title transfer theory and, and the importance of legal title and possession. And, and I do think that it was important to discuss that to get some foundation. My position is, is that a contract, of course, in a libertarian legal system is always a simultaneous exchange of title, exchange of legal title. An example that we've does talked it have about. To be, hold on. Does it have to be an exchange or could it be one way, like gratuitous or donation? Well, we'll talk about gratuitous and gifts in a, in a minute. But in order for a contract, for lack of a better word, because um, I don't, I don't, I mean, and you'll see where I'm going with this. We'll talk about gifts, I think, in a minute. But I, at least I want to get the concept of, of contract and exchange down. And I know okay. that you have some thoughts on, you know, exchange is an economic term, not a legal term. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. I well, think it's, actually, both. it's both. I, I, both. Well, it, I think that you have some. I think that you have some predilections against the common law here and consideration and that kind of thing, but we'll, we'll get there. But, but okay. my, my, my position really is that a contract, at least in a libertarian sense, is always a simultaneous exchange of legal title. And the example we've talked about is I give you, I give three bucks for a cup of coffee. I give legal, legal title to my three bucks to the barista and she gives me legal title to the coffee. But in that exchange or in that transaction, there's also a near simultaneous exchange of possession. And I say near simultaneous because no, it's really rare that you have an actual, you know, I slide you my three bucks, you slide me the cup of coffee, right? There's always some time element in the middle of this. So I take possession of the coffee and the barista takes possession of my $3. So there's both, an, there's an exchange of legal title and an exchange of possession. Now, if I take the cup of coffee without transferring title or possession to my three dollars, I've committed a crime. I've taken hey, wait, 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 say, say that again. Yeah. If I take the cup of coffee without transferring legal title or possession to the three dollars, but they're different. Which 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 one which one is the which one results in the failure or the or the implicit theft or whatever? No, it's, I think I think they're not different. I think that I think that I think that it's the failure. If I if I if I fail to give legal title or if I fail to give possession, okay, but wait, wait, how do you give legal title? Yeah, there's an implicit there's an implicit exchange there, right? But but for no, example, what I, I mean, what I mean is what I mean is you give legal title by a communication of your consent, correct? Yes, certainly. So you, you you've already communicated that before you receive the uh, no no doubt. I, I all I'm trying to show is that there's a little bit of a time element, but there's a almost near simultaneous exchange. Well, there, there could be in a simultaneous exchange. That's just one type of contract. Yes, though. no doubt. But you would agree with me that this that, that there's this near simultaneous exchange of legal. Of course, possession. of course. Okay. But 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 by the way, but that that's that that mismatch between the timing, between the transfer of title and the transfer of possession is understood by both parties. Yes, sure. Which which, mean, which means that, for example, um, you know, uh, you hand me the candy bar. And I hand you a ten dollar bill, and you've got to go back and make change. There's a little time delay between when you give me back the money that now you owe me as part of this complicated arrangement, 
And, um, but we understand that. So we would say that for like a couple of minutes, the owner of the store is in possession of my $7 and change. Right. But he, but I own it already because you, don't, you haven't given up legal title to it. Well, the, the, well, the, the owner, I did, I gave up legal title to $3 of my $10, bill. but the $7 and change you've never so, given. So, so now he owes me $7, which, which means that he's got $7 in his register and I own that already, but he's possessing it. But the fact that he's possessing it for 10 minutes or five minutes before he's able to make change um, is not trespassed because that's understood by both parties. So it's consented to. Correct. Correct. Okay. I think we agree on that point. All right. Now let's take the case of a loan. And this is a little more sticky, but there's still the time element, right? In the case of a loan, Murray gives Hans title to $1,000 today. And of course, I'm using dollars just in the generic sense here. Um, and in exchange, Hans gives Murray legal title to $1,100 with the condition that Hans deliver possession of the $1,100 one year from now. And title. Well, no, title exchanges right then and there. The legal exchange of title is simultaneous. It has to be. The exchange of possession, wait, 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 let me finish. It has to be, for, for, it has to be for, 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 for a simultaneous exchange contract. Hold on, hold on. The, the exchange of title is simultaneous. It could be. No, it always is. Hang Why? on, Why? you'll see in a minute, you'll see in a minute. What I want, my point is, is that the exchange of possession, however, is asynchronous, meaning it's different timing. Of course, it has to be okay. for a future, for a future, for a future performance or a future title transfer or for a future possession transfer, as you might call it. It has to be asynchronous. But the title has to be today. The title exchange has to be today. It's near simultaneous. Why? Why does it have to be? Because, because how do you, how do you decide what Hans what Murray owns a year from now. In other words, who's there could be multiple claimants on that $1,100. Who has the better claim on that $1,100 a year from now? The owner. Who's the owner? The person with the better claim. <laughs> That's a very lovely circle. You, you, you just cracked no, it's it. not a circle. I mean, so the better claim is the person. Yeah, we just go back to the first principles. Like, so we go to the Lockheed and homesteading principle. Right. And the contract principle. And right. so, and so, if you look at the rest of the world, who are we using? Hans and Murray in this example? Hans and Murray, yeah. So Hans is the debtor, Murray's the lender. Everyone in the world except for Hans and Murray, they all have an inferior claim to this, to this re to this eleven hundred. So I mean, wait, who why owes do them? they have an inferior claim? Because they have no claim to it. Why? What if Hans what if Hans turns around and after the day after he makes the loan to Murray, he makes the loan to Guido? You I mean you're you're I think we need to establish the fundamentals first before we talk about no, no, because this, this this illustrates the fundamentals. We're talking about just priority. I mean, of course, in the law, we uh, people listening might not realize this, and, and as you and I both know, the law has a uh, has a detailed series of um, rules that that determine priority in cases of a of of a, of a dispute between uh, two or more other claimants, right? So, so let's give a simple example just to set the stage. Yeah. Because sure. most people didn't go to law school. Um, um, I own a farm. Yep. Let's make it Hans. Hans owns a farm. He he sells a uh, he sells the naked ownership. Well, what's the word in the common law? He sells the he sells it to Murray, but retains a life estate. Okay. Okay. So he gives Murray title to it, but but Hans retains the right to use it until he dies. Okay. Which means that. We've divided the title of this real estate up so that the – what in the civil law we call naked ownership. I forgot what they call it in the common law. But the, ownership and fee. Fee absolute. Okay. It's not fee simple. No, so, but it's, it's divided, so it's not – it's like the reversionary well, interest. Murray like owns the fee. Yeah, Murray owns reversionary oh, okay. interest. So Murray, so Murray owns the fee, but Hans has a life estate. Correct. Which is a real or a property interest, which he – that means he has the right to use it until he He's dies. He's got the right to possession. Yes. Use, right. use. He can't yeah. sell it because he doesn't own the fee. Well, but he could he, sell his life estate. He could. He sell, could. He, could sell it, he could. But he he can't sell the. The point is, when he dies, that burden on the fee simple or fee absolute, whatever you call it, um, the of the total a, a, allodial ownership of the land, 
that disappears. And now Rothbard, who previously owned the fee ownership in the land, but he didn't have the right to use it during Hans's life. Right. We should have switched this example because Hans is old. Hans is younger, but whatever. Um, so when Hans dies, then his life estate evaporates, and now the ownership interest of Rothbard is 100%. So he's the full owner of it, correct? Something he, like that. The owner in fee simple absolute, yes, as the common So the question is, so let's say um, um, a, a year after Hans gave – sold Murray the fee, the fee ownership. Yeah. He sells it to someone else too. Right. Or he makes a contract saying, I, I give you this land. Right. So now when Hans dies, Murray steps onto the land, but then number two says, no, 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 I paid I paid Hans a million dollars for this land a year after he did it with you, so I'm the owner. So now we have a dispute over the land. So then the question is who owns it? And so in a court, we would say – in a property right, in a court applying property law, the court would say, um, well, we have to go back in time. The owner, The original owner was Hans on day one. He gave part of his rights to Murray by contract. Right. So now Murray has a better claim against Hans because right. of contract right? and against the rest of the world because from the point of view of the rest of the world, that is not including Hans and Murray. Right. They were not homesteaders of the land, and they didn't get right. it by contract. But then right. the second guy says, well, I have a contractual claim. It's like, yeah, but – you got a contractual claim from someone who didn't own what he purported to give you because he had already given it away, right? I think I, you would agree with me on that. I, I would but, agree with so you. So that's why also... number two, that's why number two would lose to Murray in a future dispute. So the Hold law on, has rules about priorities like this. Let, let's be very clear about this. Why? Because really, what you're articulating, you're making my point for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm not disagreeing with that part of your point. I the think the prior that owner has the better claim. How do you establish that he's the prior owner? He's got right. to have legal title. Yeah, you trace it back to where where it came from. Right. And therefore, if the title's not today, if the title transfer is not today, the near synchronous exchange of titles, then you can't establish priority. That, that's fine. I think I think that. You keep mixing this together with this exchange idea, which I think confuses the issue, especially if we do a loan where it's eleven hundred and a hundred a thousand and eleven hundred dollars and like it looks like the same thing. It's better to do either isolated one way transfers to to analyze it or to have different things transferred, like um um I'm gonna loan you five cows and then you owe me eleven hundred dollars in in a year. Like it's better to separate it so we don't conflate these things. But okay. But the point is, I I can't I, I don't think I would necessarily disagree with you that the way we characterize the effectiveness of a current transfer of a title to a future thing is that we characterize it as being effective now. Yes, I think that's correct. I think that your your current statement of intent and consent now, but it's about a future thing that you might own. Is effective now, but it's only about a future uncertain thing. That's no, that's the difference between us. Yes, and 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 my point is is that you would agree with me that at time zero, when when whatever whatever economics are in, involved in the transfer, if you don't like the word exchange, whatever economics are involved, I Murray, I don't like the word exchange. Is that I don't think that it's essential. Like this would apply. It should apply to a one way transfer too, well, like well, a donation. And we'll get there. I'm not sure that that's the case, but but just so that we well, understand. Well, well, hold on. Think about this: an exchange of 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 a payment for a service, because there's only one title exchange, but that's that's an economic exchange. Yeah, I'm not sure that that's the case, but but okay, but I'm not sure that that's the case. But but the simplest is five cows for eleven hundred dollars in the future, right? You're transferring title to the eleven hundred dollars today, and possession in the future. Well, it, de it, well, it depends on the terms of the contract. I mean, maybe the maybe the debt maybe the creditor doesn't want possession, or whatever. I mean, but but, but the point is that somebody's got the right to it's exclude. Not necessarily possession. It's not necessarily possession. It's just title. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. It doesn't have to be possession. But but right. somebody's got the legal right today to exclude the rest of the world. From, from that eleven hundred dollars, they will have the right to exclude. No, they have it today. No, they don't. Yeah, you they have, have to have a right Otherwise, today. How can, you, how can you establish priority? 
if they don't have the right to exclude today, how do you say that they have a better claim to the rest of the world? Because all action is based – all action is in the present. You cannot act to exclude someone from something in the future. It makes no sense. No, no, no. Your position makes no sense. How do you establish priority then? I, I, agree, better with, claim? I agree with you that we, we've already the, – the way I look at it is when I make this communication, it's in a sense irrevocable. It's okay. irrevocable because – um, property is alienable. Okay. Our bodies are different. So we can, and I don't think we want to talk about voluntary slavery and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole different issue. But when we talk about owned objects that come into our possession and ownership by an act of homesteading or an act of contractual exchange or ex contractual donation or gift, um, then, then the will of the owner makes sense. And so the, the fundamental dilemma or, or, or paradox or question for us is like it's 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 not too hard to explain why the contemporary con, I'm sorry contemporaneous present owner of a physical good is entitled to express his consent and get rid of it and sell it to someone else right yeah I think we can understand that the question is does that owner have the ability to sell his future things Sure. By making a statement now. Now, I sure. think you do because, as you mentioned earlier, most contracts necessarily have a future element, if only because there's no such thing as simultaneity, really. Yeah, that's right. There's near, almost no near simultaneous. I slide the three bucks to you. you I, I would say I would say there is. Me. I would say there really is no such thing as simultaneity. Just Probably like, not. just like in Austrian theory, we talk about. Um, we talk about. Um, uh, money prices, and we talk about future prices, which are just predicted and forecast by entrepreneurs, and we use present prices to a, a, as an accessory of appraisement to forecast them. But if you want to be technical, there are no present prices. There are only future prices and past prices, which are historical. That's right. They can That's be immediate right. past prices, but there's no such thing as a present price. A present price is just the price on a on a on a on a on a you know, being offered by a merchant. Which is like a bargaining point, but that's not a price until someone pays it. And once they pay it, it's a fat, it's a past price. That's so there's right. really, I mean, I'm not saying there's no such thing as the present because we act in the present, but there is no such thing as, um, as a past price. There's, I mean, as a as a present price. So I guess I would say that by the same token, there's no such thing if you're gonna if you're gonna do a contract that is an exchange. And like I said. Not every contract has to be an exchange. That's why I think it's important to make that point. But if if sometimes people do exchange things, and that's an economic phenomenon, and sometimes they want to use the law to have a legal framework to back that up, right? So they want the legal side to match the economic side. Well, the legal side always has to match the economic side. Correct. But otherwise but, you've got a crime, right? But it but it depends upon the nature of the economic exchange. So no, if, no doubt. No if doubt. the economic exchange is one owned item, one present, one currently owned item for another currently owned item, then it's a it's a more it's a more or less simultaneous, excuse me, economic exchange, not completely, but more or less. And the law recognizes that and deals with it by separating possession from ownership and saying, okay, well, if you need a few minutes to transfer it, then it's not trespass when you're hold it's not conversion or trespass when you're holding on to it because that's contemplated by the nature of this arrangement, right? Yeah. I think we agree on all this, right? Yeah, well, and I would say that you what, what what you're identifying this time function is just a matter of degree and not a matter of quality. In other words, that well, the length of time is 10 seconds or 10 years doesn't change the 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 legal nature of the transaction. I, I, I don't. I, I, well, no, it, it changes it in one sense is that when we make this agreement, if it's, it takes 10 minutes, at the moment we make the agreement, the things both exist and title already transfers. No, so, it doesn't. So, the change doesn't exist. You presume that the change is going to exist, but the change doesn't exist. That's $7. No, 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 no. It does exist. What if the store burns down in that 10 seconds? What if a thief comes in and steals that? No, no, no. It, Let's be let's be precise. Then, at the moment of the exchange, let's assume that the owner has plenty of cash. He owns the a sufficient amount of money to make change. Okay, so at the moment of the exchange, the buyer is now 
an owner of seven dollars, let's assume there's seven dollars in change that he's owed, right? He's the owner of seven dollars in the till that's sitting behind this this cashier, correct? Right. So he's the owner. He's not the possessor yet because the guy hasn't had time to turn around and hand it to him, correct? Right. So he's the owner of seven bucks. Now if the store burns down, then the owner of the store loses a lot of stuff, and I've also lost $7 because my, my $7 was unfortunately burned down, and this store is a fire, correct? Sure. There's no dilemma here. Well, the, well, I'm going to suggest there is a dilemma. And there's no theft. I'm going to disagree with that. There was an exchange. Of, that, that $7 was always mine. Correct. And, and you didn't give me that $7. That, whose risk is that? Well, that's a different issue. The, 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 I don't the, doubt. No, well, that's well, like let, it. Let, so now if we have an insurance contract, then we have a whole different other contract. Let, okay. let me do it this way, because you're you're suggesting that intent matters. And I'm going to suggest that intent doesn't matter. Not intent. It's it's consent. It's it's communication. It's what the contract is, is what the terms are. Let's let's let, let, let's say let's say I have seven dollars and I just hand it to you, Jeff, and you're holding it, and I decide not to make the purchase, and so you have to give it back to me. Right. But Why? someone walks someone walks in and they and they shoot you with a flamethrower and they burn you and the seven dollars up. Uh -huh. Okay, have you stolen the seven dollars from me? From the point of view of the victim, I don't think it matters. Well, the victim is the burned up cashier. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, in other words, no, the cashier didn't steal the money from me. The the flamethrower person, of course. And if the store burns down. Then it's it's a neg it's a freak accident that harmed the property of the store owner and also me because I foolishly entrusted them to be a caretaker of my property for for three minutes and in that minute in that three minutes then my my money got destroyed. Now if I had a side contract saying, "Hey, you have a, an obligation to repay me whatever I lose if you're not if you're negligent in the storage facilities." Okay, but that's just a second contract. But again, you're you're you're, con you're you're from the point of view of the victim, it doesn't matter whether you intended to defraud me of the seven dollars or whether it was an accident that, that you fraud is deceit. Where's the deceit? Okay, it's not a, okay. If it, from the point of view of the victim, it doesn't matter that you denied me possession of the seven dollars accidentally, or that you denied me possession of the of the seven dollars intentionally. Either way, I am out the seven dollars. Well, but it, uh, if the store burns down, that is not the, that's not being caused by the person who is safekeeping your money temporarily. So what? What does causation? It's not, it's not theft. Uh, so you're saying that there's an intent element in in, in the libertarian concept nothing, of theft. Well, it's got it's it's more about cause than intent. It's like. I mean, let's assume you have your, your grandfather's watch in a safety deposit box in the bank down the street. Yeah. Now, you own that watch, but you don't have possession of it, correct? Right. It's called a bailment contract for those of us. Right. Or in the Roman law, it's called a, a regular deposit. Right. Okay. Irregular is fungible stuff that could be commingled. Irregular is like it's you, you own that particular thing, and they're more expensive because you have to have your own box and all that. That's why for money, for gold coins, we just let them mix it together. You have an, a pro rata claim. Anyway, but for – yeah, so I own this watch in the bank down the street. Now, the bank burns down, and my right. watch is destroyed. Or the, let's say the bank is robbed. I mean whatever. Well, no, there's a difference, right? There's a difference there because the actor, the actor is the robber, right? Now, maybe the bank is on the hook. I don't know. Maybe. It depends but, on the contract. That's right. It depends on if we have an insurance contract effectively. But a typical bailment contract includes – I'm giving this to you for safekeeping. I presume you are going to keep it safe if a robber comes in and robs me. Yeah, but that's a neg that's a negligent – I mean – but the point is what's – what is – yeah, yeah. So basically there there are subsidiary or ancillary conditions to all, to all contracts, either explicit or implicit. And so one would be that, yeah, I'm giving you safekeeping. I'm paying you a fee, so that means you're supposed to do something else, and if you don't and my watch gets stolen – then you owe me some money. So that that would just be another title transfer saying, okay, we, right. we're That's transferring to you future money that compensate you for the watch if we were negligent. But if if you know if 20, 20 uh you know 20 uh 
Saudi Arabian, uh, 19 Saudi Arabian, Saudi Arabian hijackers come into the bank with Uzis and they just steal that one watch because they know the owner is a, uh, is a libertarian who hates, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> then, I mean, is the bank negligent for being robbed? Again, you're, you're mixing concepts here from the point of view of the victim. It doesn't matter. The bank who was entrusted with the safe deposit box item, the watch, has now lost, stolen, whatever, has now deprived me of my property. No, I, I disagree with you. The way you're characterizing, you're saying that you're calling me a victim, but that implies that there's someone who victimized me. That's right. And you're saying it's the banks. It's you're assuming that the contract is this absolute liability thing, which is it, it's 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 not necessarily the case. I mean, the contracts could be all over the map. Lots of contracts have. Look, we're not liable for this. I mean, you go to a supermarket, you park, and there's a sign saying we're not liable if someone bangs the, shop, the shopping cart in your car. My, my point is in all of this is just to get back to sort of first principles here. And, and again, my position, which is if you deny, so, so in the, going back to Hans and Murray for just a second, if Hans fails to pay Murray the $1,100 he owes, regardless of why, from the perspective of Murray, Hans has deprived Murray of the possession of Murray's property. That is a crime or a tort or a delict. Yeah, that's I my position. Now, why yeah, is this? Because you said the word "o," oh, which means you're still stuck in the in the in the conventional concept. I'm not. Name. I'm not. Hans transferred title. Hans, on the condition he transfer possession eleven a year from now. Hans okay. fails to deliver the possession. It's got nothing to do with the condition. So let's just focus on the one title transfer that you that you. So what you're saying is. Wait, remind, Hans borrowed the money? Hans borrowed the money. So Hans, on day one, transfers to Murray $1,100 in the future to Murray, correct? No, Hans transfers $1,100 today. Transfers legal title today. That's to very a, important. To a future one To a future $1,100. He's the, he, 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 he transfers possession. No, he doesn't. I, are we already... Is, we already in the future. He transfers he possession in the future. He's he agreed to transfer. Doesn't possession. necessarily transfer possession. He's agreed to transfer possession in the future. Sure, he does. He's agreed to transfer. No, he hasn't. What he hasn't necessarily. If Hans is a bank, Rothbard might be perfectly happy with Hans holding on to the money for him. But like that's a, a that's a little different contract. That's not a loan contract. That's a bailment contract. Yeah, but I never surrender title or possession of my wallet. Okay, I, I agree that the title. typical loan contract would say that um would say that I'm transferring eleven hundred dollars, eleven hundred future dollars to you now, which means that in one year when this uh, this future one eleven hundred dollars comes into existence, if it does, then Rothbard is the owner, and now he can demand that Hans, if he's in possession of it. Did he turn it over? Yeah, and this is where we just disagree. I what, don't. What, what, what do you disagree with? What I just said there. I, I disagree that I disagree that there's this implicit condition that the that the, the document exists in the future, or that I'm sorry that the. That but, the but Jeff, the future is all inherently. The future doesn't exist yet. I don't so anything that. in the future doesn't exist yet. That's right, but I don't think that there's an implicit condition in every contract. I, I do. I otherwise, think otherwise, any, there would any, never any be. Future, otherwise, any, otherwise, there'd never be any 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 tort or crime. Why? Because I just say it doesn't exist anymore. I don't have that eleven hundred dollars. Well, I I think you cannot steal something that doesn't exist. Right. So there is no such thing as crime or tort. Which can't be, right? No, a crime just a crime means that I violated your rights, which gives you the right to use force against me. In yeah, I say, there should, there's no example of that. I misspoke. There's no there's no theft that can occur. No, if someone commits theft, that means they use your property without your consent, and that and that, that that's an act of trespass or aggression, right? Violation of individual rights and property. Right. And that gives the victim of this act of theft some right to retaliate or get right. restitution from the from the aggressor. 
And how do I establish that there's been some interference, derogation? With because, I, because you, we can establish by property principles that you own something and someone used it without your permission. That's right, that I have legal title. Right? Which gives me the right to do something back to him. That's right. So it, it, might give me a, it, it might give me a right to a claim on some of his currently owned resources. That's but if right. he doesn't have any resources, I can't get those from him. And his, his inability to repay me is not theft. Okay. The theft already happened. You're double counting. Okay, so so let's let's go with that for just a second. You would agree with me that because there was a, cha a tra chance for transfer of legal title, I have some claim on the assets of the in the in the loan. Yeah, in the loan. Well, I think that that's a subsidiary uh, condition of most contracts, either either implied or explicit. But sure. So if so, if I loan you a thousand, if Murray loans Hans a thousand dollars. Then what he's getting in exchange is number one, a current, as you would say, a current transfer of title to a future eleven hundred dollars, and subsidiary transfers in case the eleven hundred dollars doesn't exist. So, That's for right. example, it would say something like, "So if you have liquid cash in in a year, you have more than eleven hundred dollars in liquid cash. Eleven hundred dollars of that money becomes mine, and now you have to turn it over when I demand it." And if you don't, now you're guilty of trespass or, or conversion. Um, and if you don't have eleven hundred dollars in liquid money, then then if you own a home, I can I can claim that home, or other or, or maybe some of your stocks or whatever. Uh, and if you if you're totally penniless, then in the future, whenever you come into money, then you owe me the eleven hundred dollars with interest, right. either. Either out of money or out of your current property. So you right. have this 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 web of 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 conditional title transfers, but the the lender has to realize that there this is always a risk because the future is uncertain, and so there's a chance that he will never get his money back, which is why he has to be paid interest to loan the the thousand dollars. He's taking a risk that. Well, number one, the future is less valuable than the present because of time preference, and number two, the future is uncertain. So the so the the debtor may never be able to repay him, even with this network of conditional transfers. Sure, that's true. And and if he's unable to pay, it's not necessarily theft. It's just I took a risk, I took a gamble, and it didn't pay. Again, the reason, the reason I brought up the, the civil law idea, and I'm sure there must be a common law analog of sale of a hope. You know, like like I need to um, I need to uh, plant my wheat field this year, and so I, I say, well, Jeff, I need some money to go buy seeds and to hire some workers. So why don't you give me five thousand um, bucks, and I will give you one third of whatever the crop yields in a year. Yeah, but that's not the same. That's not the same thing here. Well, but but the thing is, I'm transferring to you now ownership. To one third of my future crop, it's the that's exact right. same thing, and but that's a that's called a sale of a hope because it's a it's an uncertain thing, and the law, to its credit, recognizes that as an uncertain thing because they, they call it a hope. But my point is, if you think about it, all future title transfers are sales of a hope. So, let me let me get it this way: from the point of view of the of Murray, the guy who's been who's out eleven hundred dollars. Does he care why he's out the eleven hundred dollars? Does it matter? I don't know. I think I think if you trip over a dog on accident or if you kick it on purpose, the dog might know the difference. The dog is still kicked, regardless. Yeah. Would you? And so, if someone accidentally bumps into you on the street, or if they bump into you on purpose because they're being a dick, does it matter? Yeah. No, it doesn't matter from the yeah, point of view of the victim. Matter. Of course, from it does matter. It's okay. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. From the point of view of the victim, it doesn't matter. The victim suffers the same damages, right? The kicked dog or the accidentally stumbled dog has the same broken ribs, right? Yeah, and yeah. And if I have a seizure and my arm swings out and hits you in the face, uh -huh. you're still damaged the same amount. But I'm not even I'm not liable at all because it okay. wasn't intentional. Why? Because, because you, you are sneaking in an element of intent here. No, it's, you are it's saying not about it's not about intent. It's about cause. It's like the question is. When you're damaged, what is the cause of that damage? Okay. And if, if if it's just the universe, then okay, it's not it's not fortunate for you, but you can't blame me. I'm only blamable if I caused it. 
And yes, intent plays has a role in that because cause is something that you it's one of your actions and actions are always intentional. That's right. So you're sneaking in an intent element. Not sneaking. This is this is this is sober. This is sober Rothbardian analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm put it this way: I'm not being, I'm not, I'm being above board about. It. I'm not sneaking it in. I'm, <laughs> nothing wrong with. There's well, nothing wrong with agreeing with me. What you're saying, well, what I'm at, what I'm asking you is, you are saying that there must be an element of intent. Well, and that that and that that determines. I'm saying people are responsible. I'm saying people are responsible for their actions. Okay, and actions and are if, intentional. And, and if I don't pay you, regardless of the reason why, I have not. I have intentionally not turned over the possession of the eleven hundred dollars. No, I think it. So this is so. This is the thing. It intentionally not turning over could could be for different reasons, and I think the reason does matter. So, for example, if I if I am in possession of the eleven hundred dollars, like let's say I'm a millionaire, and yeah. Rothbard says, "Hey, you need to pay me, um, my eleven hundred dollars back." Yeah, not back. It's actually not back because it's new. It's right. like, not the original one thousand. So you need to pay me the eleven hundred dollars that you owe me, or right. Uh, more precise ways, uh, you're in possession of eleven hundred dollars of my money. That's I right. That I have legal title to. That I have legal title. I have legal title to, and now I own possession, and you should That's turn right. it over. And if you don't, now you're stealing my stuff. Right. Um, so if Hans refuses to turn it over, that is an act of theft. Right. That's an intentional. That's there's some intention there, right? It's not about intentional. Well, sure, it's 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 it's, it's intentionally refusing to respect someone's property rights. Sure. That's right. That's right. But if Hans is bankrupt and penniless and Rothbard says, give me the eleven hundred dollars and Hans says, I would love to, but I don't have any. He's not refusing to turn it over. He just can't. He can't turn it over currently, but that doesn't mean that Murray doesn't have a claim on that eleven hundred dollars in perpetuity. Right. I agree. I never disagree. I never okay. deny. Does it matter why Hans is bankrupt? It depends upon the terms of the contract. So if Hans is bankrupt because his snowball stand, his snow cone, I keep saying snowball. I should say snow cone, right? Yeah. If, if Hans's snow cone stand just doesn't work, well, then that, that was just a business risk that both Rothbard and Hans took. Like Rothbard knew that, I mean, all entrepreneurial investments are uncertain, just like the future is uncertain. So that was a risk within the scope of the original ambit of the loan agreement. So Rothbard is taking the risk. That Hans won't Hans's venture won't succeed, and he won't have enough profits to repay Rothbard. He's taking that risk. Now he has some recourse. The recourse is no, uh, he has a claim on future property Hans comes into with and with an interest accruing. He might also have recourse if he does a security device, like he says. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll get into collateral. I mean, but uh, the, the simple contract is you're taking a risk that the future the future amount owed will not be there. Okay. Um, but however, it doesn't matter why that future amount is not there. However, I would think that most loan contracts would have implied or express um, conditions on the conduct of the debtor. Um, but it depends on how much overhead. You can't draft for that. I will tell you now. Draft. Well, you can do some, like a, thousands of contracts. You cannot draft for every contingency. You can't draft for every contingency, so that's why we put things in there like good faith and arbitration clauses. And no doubt, but but, but, but that, you could have something saying like, "Listen, I'm giving you this money for the purpose of starting a snow cone stand." Sure, or it could also, be like most loans. And, and, and every month you owe me a report, and if at any given month certain thresholds are exceeded, then that gives me the right to demand that you pay me now. Whatever you have remaining of the principal that I loaned you, and stop this endeavor. That's right. That's it's called acceleration. That's right. So, That's right. so, so let's say we have a contract like that. So ha Murray lo loans Hans a thousand bucks, and in months in month six, um, Hans sends Murray the report, and it shows that the snow cone stand is losing money, and Hans has five hundred bucks left, and Murray says, "Okay, I'm going to exercise that clause of the contract and say." Okay, I'm stopping. I'm I'm halting the loan. Now I'm freezing in place the principal that I loaned you, and now that five hundred bucks is now mine again. That's right. I'm accelerating now, the loan. And then if Hans spends that money, then now he's stealing. Of course. Okay. But you, 
let's but, assume but, but, you, but, 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 you, but the money exists. All kinds of conditions. Money. You can but, craft all kinds of conditions. Yes. What happens when the loan documents are silent? Right. Well, and that's you, the problem. You have to, then you have to then you have to use supplemental provisions or 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 custom uh, customs or or uh, gap fillers. Right. Default rules, or you have to go to a judge who tries to guess what their intent would have been. I mean, yeah. there's all kinds of ways the legal system has to figure it out. But the ultimate goal of this process is to supply an answer that these two parties failed to negotiate in explicit terms. So right. in, a way, in a way, that's their fault because it was too expensive for them to do that. And they both – if it's too expensive to account for every contingency and they went ahead with the transaction anyway, then what they're saying is they're willing to take the risk that they have to resolve this uncertain area somehow, and they might lose because they didn't take the time to express it. So if they go to an arbitrator and the arbitrator awards – Rothbard or Murray or Hans the money or, or or the win in this in this in this contest, no one can really complain. But of course, what would happen is people would learn from that. And if this became a big problem, then people would start adjusting and they would start adding a boilerplate thing in their contracts sure. to handle that problem. That's right. But my point is, is that from the vic from the victim's perspective, from the from the creditor's perspective. Why do you but I don't think it's fair to call him a victim. Okay, from the creditor's perspective, I, yeah. I do think it's fair to call him a victim. But, 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 but okay. For, from and by the, the way, to, not to be not to be petty fogging, I wouldn't call them debtor and creditor because those are that that assumes there's obligations. That's the old theory of contract. Okay. But we can we can call okay. them for, from the property holder's perspective. The, pro the property holder is still out possession of eleven hundred dollars. Yeah, because it doesn't exist. Okay, regardless of the reason why it doesn't exist. Now, but what you're saying is there may be some mitigating factors, right? That, that a judge may. No, it's not mitigating. It's, sure it's it that. Is. Why it doesn't. Sure, it because is. Because Hans didn't do anything. See, I think what you're assuming. So, the reason I think you went with this, does it matter why? Because, yeah, there are cases where if Hans basically spent the money on something other than what he was. Right. Supposed, went down to Vegas and put it all on red. Spun yeah, that that's something. Away. That's something wrong or blameworthy. Okay. So, okay. Okay. But. What you're assuming is that if if Hans is unable to pay, that in itself is blameworthy. Yes, I think, that's, um, I think that should be the default rule. What, that what, should be the default I rule. Completely disagree, and the reason is because th the simple nature of such a loan is basically Rothbard is financing someone else's entrepreneurial venture. Now, in economic terms, what that means is that Hans and Rothbard are both. Staking some of their property in an uncertain entrepreneurial venture. That's, that's what it right. is economically. So but that's everybody. Venture does, which is risky. But that's everybody. There's no, there's no, everybody faces the future and everybody's an entrepreneur in that exactly. sense. Exactly. Exactly. So every time we do something where we take a risk based upon a future event, both sides that are co op and both, both hope to gain from it if it works that's right. out. And both are taking the risk that they will be out something if it doesn't work. Mm. Not what, like the property hoped Rothbard might might now might not be able to be repaid. They're right. both taking that risk. And if the if the entrepreneurial venture doesn't work out, it's not like if someone fails in a business, that is not morally blameworthy. Could be. It could right? be. But it's not necessarily. Could be. Well, only if they violated the terms of the contract. And again, you can't draft for that kind of all of those contingencies. No, you can't say, "Oh, Hans was lazier than I wanted him to be." Sure, you could. You could, but it's too much. It's too hard to. It's too hard to supervise that. And to there are partnership disputes all the time that that where they say one partner didn't pull his weight. I just literally had one yesterday. No, I agree. You you could do that, but but it becomes more and more subjective, and it becomes expensive to supervise and to define and to enforce. And like you said, you can't put every contingency in a contract right. which is why the default rule should be that if you fail to pay you have committed a crime or a tort okay well i think you can't put that in a contract because because body rights are inalienable you can't you can't make a false thing true by a default condition in a contract or even by an explicit condition like you couldn't put in a contract um like l let's make it all explicit on day 1 they do this. They do this loan agreement, and Han, they put in their clause seventeen, which says, if Hans is unable to 
pay $1,100 to Murray in one year, we hereby both agree that that will be theft. That that is just that's like saying we hereby agree that 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 the moon is made of of gold. They can say that, but it's not true. No, 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 no. That's no. From a libertarian perspective, it is always, it is always a tort. Again, it's not a tort if you're not stealing anything. You, there has to be something existing to steal. Well, ultimately, I think your problem is you think that you can steal something that doesn't exist. Oh, I say your problem. My problem with what your argument is is you 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 seem to assume that it's possible to have a tort, which is basically theft of someone's property, even though the property doesn't exist. That position, that position that you've taken assumes some sort of intent. And I don't think you can assume some sort of intent. Why it exists, why it doesn't exist is an important function in your determination of whether so, so I think that's why that's why you're sort of implicitly determined to find to basically attribute attribute fault to the to the panel yes. with that because your 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 position your position inherently requires that determination well i again let's go just for a second let's try one more time i think i yeah. think we, i think i think we just don't agree on this um go back to the do you agree that it's possible to have a sale of a hope yeah i think that's possible so I, I can sell so what you what you're calling a hope. Yes, I'm not. Well, that's, what the, that's what the law so calls it. Law. What, what it means is I'm transferring title to you now to one third interest in whatever crops my wheat field produces. Sure. Now, I might be doing that as a donation to you. I might be doing it as a gift. I might be doing it uh, out of uh, gratitude. I might be doing it because you gave me uh, some funds to hire the to buy the seeds, whatever. But for whatever reason, I'm transferring to you now. One, you know, a, a simple example is, you know, uh, uh, fund my boat. I'm going to go out into the ocean today in the Gulf of Mexico and try to catch a bunch of fish. And in return, I'm going to give you half of my haul. This is common. This happens all the time. Sure, no doubt. No now, doubt. if I come back empty, then you get half of zero. That's fine. Uh -huh. That's just what you get. That's what right. you agree to. There's no victim here. Sure, there is. Now, now, if I actually caught some fish and then I hid them and I'm lying to you, then that's a different issue. Why? But if we assume that – or if I went out on the ocean and I just smoked a joint all day and I didn't even try to catch fish. Right. You know, Why is that different? From the perspective of the guy, the, of the victim or the property owner. Because, or, because you could imagine that if they had negotiated that clause in the contract – they would say, "All right, I'm giving you a thousand dollars now to to fund your fishing expedition, um, but if you go out there and you don't actually make a, 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 a make a a legitimate effort to fish, at the moment you start doing that, then at that moment in time, my one thousand dollars transfers back to me." You, you keep adding conditions, right? Well, you keep I'm, adding conditions. I'm I'm, I'm trying to contracts. I'm trying to... As you said, you can't account for every every contingency. Right. But what that means is that language is is always imperfect and incomplete. And contracts, right. every contract that's ever existed, except maybe for the simplest, most bare contemporaries, like you know, candy bar for an apple, something like that. Except for those, they always have maybe a near infinite number of conditions, which could never be specified in language. So there has to be, always be a dispute resolution mechanism which fills in the gaps. No there doubt. No doubt, and my it is so my. I'm not adding conditions. Reality is adding conditions because there's always conditions. And it is my position that you start with the idea that if the property owner is out his property, that is a crime or a tort. Now there may be some mitigating circumstances. There is no property. He's not out his property because there is no well, property. So, so I have to go, but I want to finish this. This will clearly re lead into a part three because you always you always scurry and run with this. I've got to work. Excuse. Yeah, me. yeah. I've got to, I've got to be a lawyer. And, um, <laughs> But you know, I'm just doing this law thing till the band gets back together. So, well, I'm sure that I'm sure that these discussions will help you in your law practice. So, so let 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 me under let me let me tie this, and we can probably pick this up in a week or two. Um, 
what, why is my position important to my criticism of the limited liability of the corporation? Let me, we'll end there and that way we can pick this I, up. I, yeah, I'm curious. I was wondering where you're going with this. Yeah. So, so let's be clear what a corporation is, right? It's an association of individuals to whom the law provides a privilege of limited liability. Okay. Okay. Thus, when as a general proposition, and just as a general proposition, when the person representing the entity, the business entity, commits a tort, the modern law limits the liability of the managers and owners of that entity. Thus, if the tort damages exceed the assets of the entity, the victim of that tort bears the cost of that tort. Put differently, the law socializes the cost of the tort onto the victim of the tort. This is one of my criticisms of the corporate form. Where there is a default rule of limited liability, this rule socializes the cost of the corporation's torts onto the corporation's victims. Again, this is the whole loan kind of concept, right? That, that it, it doesn't matter what, why the tort victim is a victim, whether that's an act of, you know, whether that was an act of negligence or an intentional tort, the tort victim is still out. And when there's limited liability, it's still out, it's still victimized. And when there's limited liability, the, when there's government imposed limited liability, the tort victim can't go and recover from those who created the tort in the first place. Well, what I think is um, this gets back to our previous disagreement on corporations. I don't agree with your definition of corporations from a libertarian perspective, even from a legal perspective. They're not an association of individuals. In the law, they're, they're, they have a corporate personality. Which... Sure, but the, the fact is, is that they are an association of individuals. That the law recognizes them as a person doesn't doesn't alter the reality that they are an association of still individuals, right? Corporations are collective, is a convenient collective now. It's like saying France invaded or invaded Germany. Well, corporation, invade corporation Germany. law means, no, it means, no, it means the corporation has legal personality. I would disagree with that. Like I think in, in libertarian law, there would not be a corporation as defined by the current law. There would not be a legal, there's only individuals in, in libertarian law. So right. yes, in libertarian law, there would only be associations of individuals that have a contract among each other to own property and to arrange their affairs a certain kind of way. And I don't care about the contract between the owners and managers. What I care about is the torts committed in furtherance of the entity. Well, I think we need to have another talk. I think what we need to do is have a talk about corporation limited liability because I think what you're doing is you sense that there's some – I won't say you sense there's some problems with the argument, but you sense that part of our disagreement could be resolved if you can – if you can make this point about future title transfers. That's right. That's exactly and right. So you want to tie them together. But I think if we're going to go there, we need to talk first about corporates, corporations, limited liability, because that is an interesting topic. Um, um, I don't think limited liability is uh, a privilege granted by the government because I don't think owners would be liable for the torts of employees anyway. Yeah, and we can discuss this in, in more detail later, but I am running out of time. So. Okay, well, go back to your real job, make some money so you can afford to take an hour off every now and then and to <laughs> add to the corpus of liber liber libertarian legal understanding in the world. All right, well, until part three, right? Until part three, until I get back from Iceland. Safe travels. <laughs>